Hi, everyone. Welcome to Summer Meals, Recruiting and Retaining Meal Sites, hosted by the Food Research and Action Center, or FRAC. I'm Steve Hayward, FRAC's Senior Communications Coordinator. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few brief housekeeping items. We expect this webinar to run about 60 minutes. We are recording the presentation and will send the recording and slides in a follow-up email. Closed captioning is available. To turn captions on, click the CC button in the bottom task bar. If you do not see the CC button, click the three dots that say more and click show captions. At the end of the pres presentation, there will be time for questions and answers. To ask a question, please use the Q&A tab. With that, I'll pass it off to Kelsey Boone, Senior Child Nutrition Policy Analyst at FRAC. Thanks so much, Steve. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar on recruiting and retaining meal, summer meal sites. My name is Kelsey Boone, and I'm a Senior Child Nutrition Policy Analyst at FRAC, and thank you so much for joining us today. This is the third webinar in our series on back to school uh, summer, summer meal basics. If you would like to find previous recordings or register for future events, you can find those on our website, frac.org. Today's conversation is important because recruiting and retaining sites is a key building block for ensuring robust access to the summer nutrition programs. If there aren't enough sites or if sites fall off the program year to year, it is difficult to operate sustainably. We have three great speakers joining us today from the advocate and sponsor level that are going to share their strategies for successful recruiting and retaining sites to build strong summer meal participation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide. So today's uh, presenters are uh, Ashina Moses from Florida Impact, um, Eugenie Sellier from Feeding Alabama, and Kelsey Kiefer from Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. Next slide. There are a lot of pieces to think about when you start out with recruiting sites, but here are some key things to think about. The first thing to do is determine your capacity to expand and figure out where the gaps are in service. Questions to ask your sponsor can be, can you take on additional sites? And how many more sites could you take on? As for advocates and state agencies, you can play a key role in determining gaps in participation. There are key map resources, which I can highlight on the resource slide that we don't, so that we um, so can show where sites were in previous years. Um, just, are you all aware of areas that have no sites and should have targeted outreach? Are there any counties or communities that have no sites at all? Um, you know, th that information, having that list or an idea of where to focus outreach can help with recruiting sites. From there, sharing information on becoming a site through social media, radio, partner channels, and mailings can be a key way to get the word up, out about the opportunity. Another piece of recruiting sites is to consider new partners for expansion and reach out to them early in the process. This can include faith-based partners, healthcare, libraries, schools, and more. Consider where children congregate during the summer and what partners should be at the table. Uh, next slide. Once you have summer sites participating, it's important that they keep coming back year after year. This creates consistency and ensures that programs are able to grow. Some best practices for retaining sites year after year include establish methods for communicating with sites throughout the year to see what worked, what didn't, and what their plans are for the next summer. Work directly with sites that may have had issues the previous summer. Uh, sponsors can ask sites to complete an exit poll at the end of summer to share feedback to shape operations and future participation. And finally, they can ask sites to fill out an intent to participate form by January to determine where they are, where there are gaps in returning sites. Next slide. FRAC and USDA both have resources to help support recruiting and retaining sites. Here are some of those, and they include FRAC's Summer Eligibility Mapper to determine whether a site is eligible, the USDA Capacity Builder, which is an amazing tool to see where sites have been in the past. Um, it also lets you put on different layers to see where 
there are other partners and facilities and where you can see uh, gaps in, in service. Uh, FRAC resources include outreach to increase participation in the summer nutrition program and a guide on state agency summer nutrition sponsor retention strategy. Finally, the USDA toolkit includes site recruitment strategies, um, reaching underserved uh, and unserved areas, and tips for targeted growth. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ashina who from Florida Impact, who is going to uh, expand on some of this. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for taking the initiative to get on a call like this right now instead of waiting right before summer. Um, summer Break Spot is an amazing program and I, pre I wanna start by saying thank you all for taking on this role as sponsors. I appreciate you all so much for the work that you do to ensure that children receive meals when the school doors are closed. You could go to the next slide, I'm sorry. So who are we? Florida Impact is a statewide anti-hunger organization. We're dedicated to advancing health equity by ending hunger for all Floridians. We mobilize communities to maximize access to federal, state, and local food and nutrition programs with a focus on Florida's most vulnerable um, populations why we work with Summer Break Spot. So we all know that Summer Break Spot is a federal nutrition program. So it falls right within our mission, which is to mobilize the community to get access to federal nutrition programs. We are passionate about ensuring our children have access to nutritious, nutritious meals, even when school is out. So our involvement in Summer Break Spot, along with our network of partners, we have been involved and very influential in expanding the Summer Break Spot program. We are not a sponsor or a site, we are a connector. So what we basically do is connect sponsors to sites. We fill in the gaps and ensure that the areas of need are receiving the resources. Through our grassroots work, we connect sponsors to community organizations that serve as meal sites. And our methods of site recruitment. We reach out to state agencies and sponsors to identify the gaps. So last year at the beginning of the summer, we reached out to someone at FDAX just to get a list of the participants in the summer break spot program. We then use that list and cross reference it with our um, hunger data profile to see the areas of need, the areas where families are experiencing food insecurity and to check if there are sponsors in those areas. And if um, the sponsors, sponsors in the area were, were open to increasing um, site participation, we would look in that area for organizations that be willing to join them and provide meals. We stay connected to communities in need across the state all year long. So it's not just about summer for us. We're always connected to the community. We're always boots on the ground every time. Um, we try to be um, present when there are food distributions. We connect with nonprofits across the state. We connect with faith-based organizations. We just try to stay connected as much as possible. This helps us to identify when a community is in need even before summer rolls around so that we can start working on fulfilling that need before that time. And it also um, helps us identify organizations that have the capability to host a summer feeding program. Because sometimes even before summer, you could come across a church and it may be a new church and they're talking to you about the different things that they do and how they want to work in the community. They wanna be a community church. And then we, we remember around summertime, hey, this church mentioned that they wanna do a youth program during the summer, they might be a great, um, candidate for a meal site. So it's good to stay connected because you're able to fill in those gaps way ahead of time. We consider the data that has already been collected to identify areas of need. A great indicator is the CEP program. So if you have a CEP school in your county or a CEP school in your neighborhood, you know that that area has been identified as an area of need. So that is a prime area to increase um, 
to look out for um, organizations to be um, participants as meal sites so that we could expand the program. And we think outside the box. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't just look at working with schools or community centers. There are many different ways that we can reach as many children as possible. So we look at, um, we've had conversations with the Haitian Chamber of Commerce in Treasure Coast. They're interested in coming on as a meal site. We've spoken to, um, like I said, faith-based organizations. We've spoken to private schools that do programs during the summer. You can also look for your, um, your dance companies, your dance studios that do summer, in, in, um, summer intensive programs or um, apartment complexes. We've worked with apartment complexes and it's just a matter of tweaking a few things, making sure they have an enrichment activity, making sure that they have a space where the children can sit down and enjoy a meal. But just don't be afraid to think outside the box. You can always look to um, your sponsors or um, your local and state agencies to ask if it's okay, you know, and they'll let you know, hey, they need to fill out, fulfill this, this, and this requirement, but it doesn't hurt to think outside of the box. And our methods of retainment. First and foremost, we maintain communication with sites and sponsors throughout the year, especially during the summer months. So we don't want our sites or our sponsors to think, oh, we're hounding them because it's summertime. We stay connected. We find out what they're doing during the summer, um, not during the summer. We find out what they're doing during the year to see how we can support them, whether it's just a food distribution or they need help for a volunteer activity, do they need someone to package food. I've gone to... Um, the second harvest to help support them in distributions. I've gone to some of our meal sites, you know, in off times during the year to help them do other kinds of work. Staying connected lets you lets them know that you are passionate not only about checking off a box during summer, but you're passionate about their mission as well. So it's important to stay connected in the off months. It's especially important to stay Stay connected during the summer. If you're a sponsor, especially if you're a sponsor and you have a bunch of meal sites and you have people calling and you're not returning calls, it kind of leaves a bit bad taste in people's mouths and they don't want to deal with that for years to come. So they want you want to make sure that you're staying connected. You're answering their calls. Even if you don't get to answer them, you return the calls, return the emails always, always. One way to make sure that you're doing that is to designate a staff member, because sometimes leaving it all on one person to answer the calls and emails of 20 sites could be overwhelming. So if you have a staff and you could say, hey, you, Aaron, you're in charge of three sites, and Jane, you're in charge of four sites, those people can act at as liaisons between the sponsor and the sites and make sure that all the needs of the sites are met so that children are fed. Um, begin strategizing for September from September of the previous year. I cannot stress how important it is to not not wait till summertime to start strategizing or wait till spring to start strategizing. From the time the summer ends, which is September, you should start thinking, okay, what did we do wrong? What can we improve on? What did we do right? And how can we expand the right that we did? So you start strategizing, you start coming up with ideas. So that way, by the time summertime Time comes around the following year, your meal sites are not overwhelmed with strategizing at that very moment because it's very difficult to strategize and implement at the same time. Another great way to retain your sites is to send thank you cards to sites and sponsors showing appreciation for hard work. Appreciation goes a long way. Gratitude goes a long way. Nothing is better than having somebody say, hey, you did this and I appreciate you. That alone will make sites feel valued. They feel like they're more than just a number or an extension of your work, but they're part of a great um, mission and a wonderful team. Assist sites and sponsors with marketing and preparing for summer feeding. Um, last year, we assisted organizations with hosting spike events. You know, spike events are a way to 
let the community know that you are feeding. Those spike events can be hosted at the beginning of summer or in the middle of summer. They can even be hosted in the spring. I was talking to um, a potential sponsor in Broward County about possibly hosting one in the spring to let parents know, hey, um, during that spring break period to let parents know, hey, during the summer, we will be feeding. And if we could do a small pilot of a feeding program during the spring, we could kind of give parents an idea of what summertime would look like. So um, engaging in that um, marketing piece is very important, letting them know that you're hands-on and being present when they do those events, helping them with uh, signage, helping them know where to place signage, what's um, what's more most efficient. You know, it's not just about putting signs in front of the site and of the location where the meals would be served. It's important to place summer break spot sites by the schools, place them where um, car riders are being dropped off and picked up so that parents can see that, hey, they'll be serving meals. Use social media, use your social media platforms and start posting on social media from springtime, even before springtime, letting parents know that your site or you're a sponsor that's going to sponsor these sites and these sites under you will be serving children during the summer. Um, assist and Finally, the last thing is to have an end of year celebration. Again, this is another way of showing gratitude, you know, coming together and thanking your sites for the great work that they did over the summer. This is an, an also an opportunity for you to go over your successes and your areas of opportunity. During that time, recognize every single site, but it would be also great if you could recognize the sites that have had amazing numbers, had large participation, a way of saying you did amazing. And it's also a tool to kind of encourage the other sites to push forward, to try to attain that same level of recognition, but do not leave that end of year celebration without saying thank you to every single solitary site and calling them by name. You can also look to the site supervisor to nominate staff members, you know, at their site that you can recognize at that end of year celebration, but it's always good to have that celebration to show your gratitude for the hard work that was done. Next slide. Well, that's all I have. This is exact. This is how Florida Impact has worked to recruit sites and how we've worked to retain them. If you have any questions, I'm here to ask all of your questions. Answer all of your questions, sorry. Thank you so much, Ashina. Um, and now we're going to pass it off to Eugenie Sellier. Yes, thank you, Kelsey. Um, as you said, I'm Eugenie Sellier. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs at Feeding Alabama. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our organi organization and then we're gonna jump into what our recruitment and retainment strategies are. So next slide. So a little bit about Feeding Alabama. We are a state association that is made up of eight member food banks. Uh, we partner with these food banks and provide services to them. So we assist them by obtaining more food and funds, fostering public awareness of their mission, and also creating partnerships to help alleviate hunger. Uh, across the service area, we serve as a summer feeding sponsor. So we partner with a handful of these food banks to actually operate sites on the ground. We have coordinated regional coordinators that help us operate this program um, across that area. So next slide. So a little bit about our program work. We've operated the summer feeding program for about seven years now. We've served over a million meals and snacks across 19 of those 67 counties. We've reached nearly 20,000 kids in this time. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, we saw record numbers with serving over 750,000 meals and snacks. Last summer uh, with some of those uh, pandemic flexibilities going away, we did see a little bit of decrease in program participation, but a lot of our returning sites were still with us. Uh, so we served about 39 sites and reached just under 2000 kids last year. A lot of our sites are all open and they're all in affiliated sites. Some of the partners that uh, we see every summer or sites that come back are gonna be our boys and girls clubs. 
YMCAs, uh, we do housing authorities, apartments, uh, any kind of public service buildings like parks and rec community centers. We do partner with some schools, faith-based organizations, and then any kind of camps, not just summer enrichment camps, but there's also youth development camps as well. We do operate an after-school at-risk program that does help with retaining some of our sites too and by providing that wraparound year service. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about retaining sites. So one of the things we do is reach out early. So as of today, we've already sent out our application for this summer. We've already began that conversation. Uh, we do set priority deadlines for our returning sites so they uh, can get theirs in first, get theirs in early, and get priority. Uh, we do have a simplified process for them just to make it a little bit easier so when they're doing their application they're, they are updating their information instead of having to re-enter it all so uh, we we are providing a little bit more uh, customer service for them just to help keep them coming back uh, as I mentioned we do year-round programming so with offering the after school program we see sites that partner with us during the school year and then they'll also come and partner with us during the summer so we're always engaging with them and we see them returning. Um, part of that engagement piece as well is also just staying in contact with any sites that aren't participating in that after school program. So we may engage them through post summer meetings, through um, newsletters, program updates throughout the school year. Another thing to think about when retaining sites is to invest in them. Uh, but let me say, if you plan on using any kind of program funds, you have to get approval from your state agency. So before you use any program funds, be sure uh, to check with your state agency, get prior approval before you spend any of that. If you're using uh, private funding, of course, you may have a little bit more flexibility there. But the more you invest in your sites, the more uh, the partnership will grow and they'll want to continue to work with you every summer. So some ways to think about supporting their program, especially their food service, is thinking about what items they may need. So so any non-food supplies like thermometers, uh, cleaning supplies, uh, uniforms, maybe aprons, t-shirts, things like that, uh, any kind of food service equipment. So depending on what your meals look like, thinking, of, thinking about buying them, all the equipment they need to operate uh, that program. And then also think about other stuff for their enrichment side of their program. So if they need any kind of enrichment equipment that you're able to provide them with. I know one of the things we did um, during training to help incentivize our, our sites was to do a raffle of enrichment uh, equipment. Um, and they, lo they love those things. So, you know, like with hula hoops, jump ropes, uh, cheap recreation equi equipment that they can continue to use and put add to their programming. Other things to consider is to any items that may help promote their program. So we do outreach toolkits and then any other promotional items like stickers, uh, t-shirts, uh, kids love temporary tattoos. That's something we've done. So think about things like that to where they can really enhance their program um, to really get the word out more and also provide uh, great service to the kids. So an another way is to definitely build in that site feedback. So uh, to, to make them feel more invested in the program. Uh, part of this is making sure they're having a great experience and their kids are having a great experience. So we have, uh, we survey our sites every summer uh, to make sure we are definitely meeting their expectations. And if we're not, what can we do to continue to meet it or go beyond? So we also have summer debriefing sessions or post-program meetings. You can do, um, you know, a celebratory meeting or something like that with the sites where you're saying all your successes for the summer, and then you're also getting that feedback from them. Anytime you are getting feedback from them or engaging with, engaging with them, I highly, su highly su suggest that you uh, incentivize them or give them gifts just uh, so they feel valued and they're you're not just they're not just giving you feedback for nothing and that you're also making those changes to your program so always continue to enhance your program uh, this can be done rather from that feedback you're getting from those sites or just by looking at your internal processes. So there's always a way to, to continue to make your program more customer friendly. You know, we've been doing this program for seven years now and we're still updating it. So one of the things we're looking at doing for this summer is to try to get everything in one place for the sites. We have about 50, not that many, but probably at least five or six different uh, Google Forms that we have them fill out for updating their service times, updating their, their field trips, 
all that information. And that's even doing their meal orders. So we're trying to combine that all into one form they can go to, fill it out, and then it all uh, organizes itself into different spreadsheets for us. So, you know, with that, we're creating a, a portal for them that they can log into and all the information they need for summer feeding is right there. So we're trying to make it as user friendly for them and everything's in one place. They can go on that portal, do their meal orders. They can get a justice for all poster if they need it. They can get tally sheets if they need it. If they need to update their serving time, if they need to reprint out a meal serving poster, everything is in that portal. It's their own very website. They can go on and do it. So, you know, that we really try to build on that customer service and that helps keeping you know help keeps our sites coming back every year because of that service we provide them with all right next slide so when it comes to recruiting sites uh, we uh, do prioritize targeted recruitment so we do look at our previous summer's data you know as an organization where where did we serve last summer uh, where did we serve previous summers are there places for us to expand into we also look at uh you know state mapping to look at what else is going on in the state uh, we do our, our state agency does provide us with target county so there are specific counties in our state state where there's um, underserved areas where there's limited sponsors and limited sites. So, you know, if, if that's within our capacity, we'll definitely look to target those areas and try to recruit sites there. Uh, and then whenever we're also working with the state agency, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the other food banks that we work with, if there's anything that, you know, we can relate to them to help promote the program. So outside of the state, that's the state agency, there's also other regional partners to consider when you're recruiting sites, uh, not just to get your messaging, but out, but also to you to do some peer-to-peer -peer learning or learn different strategies. Uh, United Way is a great one, um, at least in our state they are. So uh, think about those local community organizations that may be working with a lot of nonprofits in your community that could be a great outlet to spread word about your program. Um, and also the impact it has. So we do have some state anti-hunger groups we work with as well. We have a state work group. Uh, we also work with our food banks to help promote and spread the word about uh, our programming. We're actually developing a toolkit for our food banks so they can easily do uh, social media posts. So we have verbiage around that just to kind of spread the word. Uh, we also have a state group called ETCHA, the In Child Hunger in Alabama group. So this is made up of different state agencies and also statewide nonprofits that uh, are really working to end child hunger and make an impact. So we use that group to uh, come up with strategies and also promote our program. I will say a lot of those state and regional partner meetings and convenings are happening in the off season. So, you know, a lot of this work, even though, you know, right now we're, we're really starting to talk a lot about summer feeding, a lot of this work has already started. We, you know, we have quarterly, continuous quarterly meetings uh, to, to strategize and, and plan out what's coming with summer. So, um, you know, especially during the off season, I would take advantage of that. I know November, December, January, are usually slower months. So definitely take advantage of the off season and try to get ahead on your summer planning with recruitment plans. Um, other than that, definitely look at marketing and outreach campaigns. Like right now, we're actually already running social media campaigns to help recruit sites. Uh, there's other outlets you can look at, like radio, television, print. I did want to highlight TV and radio interviews. Uh, those are generally no cost. So unlike, you know, some of those other advertisements, you may have to pay for them. Uh, with TV and radio interviews, you can call up your local television station or radio station and see if they will, you know, be willing to bring you on for an interview. Uh, generally, they're pre-recorded, so, you know, there's not too much anxiety with being live on the air. Uh, but yeah, you can you never know who's listening on those interviews, and we have been able to pick up some sites, even rural sites, by doing those, uh, especially those radio interviews. So that that's a that's a good way to get your message out. Uh, also, look at having interest meetings for potential sites. So a lot of times when you're talking to new partners, a lot of them have never even heard of summer feeding before. They don't know, you know, what you're talking about. So what we do is we try to, you know, kind of give them a nice overview. We make it a very short meeting, virtual meeting. We try to make it convenient to, you know, to those potential partners. We'll do it over Zoom. There'll be no more than 30 minutes. We'll try to do it during a lunchtime or during an after school hour time where we know they can pop on, they can listen. Uh, you know, if that's not something that's 
you know, that works out for their convenience. You know, we've done pre-recorded videos as well. So just a little three to five minute pre-recorded video of saying, this is what summer feeding is. This is how it operates. We'd love to have you as, as a potential site. This is what you would be doing as a potential site with us. Uh, you can post it on your social media. You can post it on your website. Easy way to give potential partners, you know, a good overview of the program so they know what to expect. Utilize your current partnerships with your sites and partner organizations. So this is something I relied heavily on, especially with doing outreach in rural communities. Uh, you know, a lot of times um, it can be hard to find partners. So what I'll do is I'll rely on current sites and I'll call them, talk to them, see if there's any other programs they're aware of, uh, other uh, partners in the community we can reach out to. And generally they're gonna have one or two names they'll share with us or one or two organizations they'll share with us that say, hey, I know they run a summer camp, you should contact them. Um, or, you know, or, you know, this organization has a facility and it'd be perfect to have a summer feeding site, contact them. So we really rely on those current partners to help us find new sites. Um, it's not something, of course, that you know we're asking them to do, but we will generally do more targeted outreach to those specific sites in, in those targeted areas and say, hey, you know, we're having trouble finding partners. Can you help us or you know point us in the right direction? Um, and then with those partner organizations, so I mentioned some of those regional groups, you know, if, if they have any idea of you know potential partners, definitely look, you know, and talk to them about that. Also, uh, one thing I didn't mention is your state agency. So one thing that our state agency will do is they'll refer sites to us. You know, sometimes there are sponsors that may not be or potential sponsors that may not be set up to become a sponsor yet or an organization not ready to become a sponsor yet. Maybe they need a little bit uh, more time to get experience. So, you know, a, the state agency may suggest that they become a site first or there may be organizations where uh, their sponsor is not participating this year, so their site's looking for a new sponsor, and the state agency will refer those to us. So that's why it's really important to have a strong partnership uh, with your state agency as well. If you don't know where to start, a good starting point is to talk is to talk to the administrating state agency for the program, and also check in with your local school. I know I haven't said a lot about schools, but you know, generally, uh, a school is going to be operating. Um, a summer feeding program, seamless summer program, they're usually the first outlet in the community that will most likely be offering some kind of programming like that. If they're not, they they will at least be aware of it, familiar with it. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we like to do, especially when we're doing outreach into uh, specific areas is to contact the local CMP director. So we'll reach out to the school district's child nutrition programs director, and they will have a, a great idea of, you know, what they're planning to do as a school system this summer um, and, you know, the potential of what the program looks like in their community. So I do suggest reaching out to schools. They are a great resource. And even if you just go and sit down with them and maybe talk about, uh, you know, ways you can help them or, or, or feed their kids for the summer. So definitely a good starting point. That is all I have. Um, good luck recruiting and planning as we're jumping into summer feeding. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions um, about some of our methods. I'm happy to share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and next, we will pass it off to Kelsey Heaver. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I will not take too much time because most of my stuff is going to echo Ms. Cellier. Um, so before we get started though, let's talk a little bit about the food bank that I work for, which is the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. I'm the manager of child nutrition programs there. And our program is comprised of five different child nutrition programs. So three which are privately funded and two which are federally funded programs. The two federally funded are CACFP and SFSP. Um, and we do utilize some of our sites that we partner with during the school year to help us re, uh, recruit and retain sites uh, for the summer. Um, we ha have 34 counties that we serve here in Central and Eastern North Carolina. And our sponsorship is a little unique because we're reliant mostly on vendors. We do not have a central kitchen prepare meals or anything like that. So we use, utilize a lot of vendors in our area to deliver meals to sites. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So from 2022, here are some of the stats that we had. We served 34 sites in 13 counties 
and uh, it was just over 40,000 meals for the summer. We ran all the way from June through August. And that's something that as a sponsor, I encourage you to do if you have the capacity to operate all the way from when school lets out all the way to when schools let back in. I encourage you to do that. Your sponsorship will be more attractive to those in the community who are trying to serve kids throughout the summer. And we can go on to the next slide. This is a really cool map that um, our child nutrition coordinator, Anna, created for us using GIS. So this is something that we reference throughout the school year as we're planning for uh, SFSP. We look at where our sites were the previous year, where our vendors were the previous year. So that way we can kind of think about where we want to recruit sites for the following year. Um, so, for instance, we know that we have vendors located out in Moore County, but we only had three sites out there um, in that area. So how can we get more site participation in that area where we know that we have a vendor to provide meals for them? Um, and also looking where we might have some gaps in service where we may not have a vendor to serve meals or we may not have any sites located in that county, county and how to get into that county. Of course, when we look at that, we're thinking about the capacity builder as well and where school, school food authorities and other community sponsors are already serving. So that way we know that we're not overlapping service, but we're reaching out to those sites who need a sponsor for the summer. And I think we can go on to the next slide. So um, who do we partner with for the summer? So we are a community sponsor. Like I said, if you're unfamiliar with that, it just essentially means anyone in the community can come to us and be under our sponsorship for SFSP. Um, and we're under the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, this program. The North Carolina Public Par Department of Public Instruction refers some sites to us. And um, we have some other methods that we use to recruit sites. Uh, we seek partnerships with those planning to serve or are already serving those in the community. So like I mentioned before, we do operate some programs during the school year. We do send out communication to those programs, letting them know that we will be having SFSP coming up in the summer and that if they want to be under our, our sponsorship for kids' summer meals, they are more than welcome to. Ooh, my light's going on and off, y'all. Sorry. Um, but... Where our food bank does not require that those who partner with us for summer be partner agencies. So we do have a formal onboarding process for those who are under uh, our school year programs, but those who join us for the summer don't have to be formal partners with us. They can just join us for the summer and be able to take advantage of these, this awesome program. So this past year, we sponsored a bunch of different organizations um, and they were an eclectic group. We had camps, faith-based organizations, community centers. We actually had a charter school that reached out to us. They served upwards of 400 kids a day um, because they didn't have access to food. So it was something that we were able to partner with them to provide meals to kids. Apartment complexes. And this past summer, we also had a theater that joined us um, that was serving meals to kids. Next slide. One second, y'all. We're back. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing new this year. So this year we're operating from June 19th to August 25th. Schools here are letting out toward the beginning of June. We're waiting a, a week um, after the end of school. So as early as we possibly can, but giving ourselves time as well to understand our capacity and the capacity of our sites. So in areas where we may not be able to reach out to uh, as many kids, uh, we may reach out and do more promotion there, or we might do some more marketing in that area. If we have a site supervisor come to us and say that their technology isn't working or the technology that they have is not um, working well with the system that we use to track meals, cartwheel, we'll provide them an iPad. So that's the week that we'll be doing that. And then we're just setting up our team for success for the summer. So some of the things that we're doing to recruit sites this summer are advertising new additions to our program. So when thinking about the program that we operated last year and the program we wanna operate this year, we thought about three key areas. We thought about meal pickup for sites, two-part SFSP training for site supervisors, theme weeks, and fun buckets for our sites. 
Another way that we reached out to those who um, are going to be uh, site supervisors or sites for us this summer is through mass marketing platforms. So we utilize SendGrid at the food bank, but we've also used MailChimp in the past, and it makes it super easy to send out an email blast to everyone on your list to let them know that we're going to be a sponsor this year and about our program changes. Next slide, please. So let's talk about why these new initiatives. These essentially all boil down to increasing the quality of our customer service. Who is our SFSP customer? Vending partners, site supervisors, and the children we serve all have different experiences when they come to an SFSP site. And how do we increase the quality of their experience under our sponsorship? So the first initiative that we chose to pick up this summer is meal pickup for sites. So in the past, like I said, we are a vendor-based sponsor. We're relying upon vendors to, in the past, deliver meals to these sites. We did have some issues in the past that these vendors were busy. They were, uh, had some difficulty getting to the sites. Their vans broke down. Things happen. So we're putting the power in the hands of our site supervisors, and we're empowering them to be able to go pick up the sites for their, their uh, meal site. Um, so that way they don't have to worry about when the van will be coming to deliver their meals. If they have the capacity to do so, they can go and just pick it up directly from the vendor. Another thing that we're doing this summer differently is a two-part SFSP training. In the past, we've done a, a one-time in-person training with our site supervisors, which was great. And I feel like our site supervisors gleaned a lot from that. But in order to increase um, their knowledge and also their capacity, we're bringing that even further and doing a two-part training this year. The first part of the training will be an online training that the site supervisors will take that will uh, clue them in on all of the basics of the program. So the regulations that surround it, what's expected of them as a site supervisor, and uh, what they are going to need to do this summer to operate a site successfully. The second part of the training is going to be an in-person practical training session. So in that in-person practical training session, we're going to focus on practical skills for them. Things like marketing and site promotion, activity planning and nutrition education for these kids. And for those who need it, technical assistance if they don't have much experience with technology and need some assistance. And the final initiative that we're taking on this summer is theme weeks and fun buckets. Increasing the engagement of the children at the site so they keep coming back and having fun. One of the most discouraging things for our site supervisors this past summer was when they did all this work to set up a site and then the kids didn't show up. Or they set up a site and kids came for a little while, but then the attendance slowly petered off. So how do we avoid that? Um, we have to understand that the children that we're serving coming to these sites are also our customers, and we have to increase our customer service to meet that need. When they come to a food bank sponsored site, we want to make sure that they are receiving a nutritious meal, but that how do we keep them coming back with fun? We're putting together a toolkit that is based around theme weeks. So each week we'll have a theme that um, will have activities for our kids to create or to do an activity related to that theme. We've reached out to our nutrition education team for more ideas to incorporate nutrition education into theme weeks and theme activities so that way all can enjoy. And we cannot wait. Fun buckets, um, like Ms. Celia was also saying, is something that we're also going to be doing this year because we know that investing in our sites will reap a reward for us. So fun buckets are going to have things like chalk, jump ropes, footballs, but it'll also, some of the fun buckets will be related to the themes for the theme weeks of this year. So that way it'll have things like, I don't know, sand pail or balls if it's sports week. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Next slide. How are we getting the word out? This year, we are doing a couple of different things. So one of the things that we've done in the past that has um, given us good return is site interest meetings. So like Ms. Celia was saying, how do the people in your community know about your sponsorship? How do they know even what the summer feeding program is? 
Um, these site interest meetings are an opportunity for us to educate them. So we hold ours via Teams and we post a link for it on our website. So that way as community partners call in and speak with us and they're interested in the program, we can refer them back to the website to see the application link number one, which we already have posted, and also to see the link to join this Teams meeting where they can learn more about our sponsorship. We advertise on the Food Bank's website and also through our social media channels. Early in the year, we get with our social media people, we get with our communications department, and we talk to them about how we're gonna set up communication plan for this year. Um, so that communication plan includes everything from how we're going to engage with the sites now and how we're going to engage with the sites once the summer starts. Planning ahead will save you a lot of work in the long run. So um, like for instance, during the summertime, we do a weekly newsletter, but we're planning now about the contents of those weekly newsletters. So that way, whenever our sites are, are getting those newsletters, the contents are um, reflective of what's going on with their summer, but also include helpful resources for them to stay engaged. We do email blasts via mass marketing websites. Like I mentioned earlier, we utilize SendGrid, but there's also a free platform MailChimp that you can use to reach out to these sites via email and we can, a very convenient platform. Um, and we're also speaking about our sponsorship at an event organized by a community organization. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit more about that community organization. So the community organization that I'm referencing, oh, there we go, is the Downey's Partnership for Children. So they're not actually a hunger-based um, community partner. They focus more on education in their community, but we know that education and meals go hand in hand. If kids are hungry, it's harder for them to learn. So, and also during the summer, it's great for us to have this partnership because they give enrichment materials to their sites to increase literacy, to make sure that they're staying up to date with um, all the things that they might have missed during the school year. It's a great partnership with them. And they're giving us the opportunity to speak with some of the faith-based organizations, the camps, the community centers that they are partnered with about our sponsorship. And so seeking out these community partners that um, are in that community that understand the needs of the community is a, a great thing to do. I highly recommend finding these community partnerships through networking or talking to the partners that you already have about who they're partnered with. Um, so that way you can maybe make a mutual partner. And that, that is all I have for today. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, just wanted to flag really quickly before we turn to questions that there are, we do have two more upcoming summer webinars in our series. The next is in two weeks on February 23rd, and that is on planning and partnerships. And then our final in the series is on developing an outreach and marketing plan, and that will be on March 9th. So, um, do you want to say that all of these materials will be sent out in a follow-up uh, a follow-up email in about a week so that will include the slides as well as a recording um, and links to all of the resources that are in these um, in these slides so um we did get a couple of questions um one was about finding maps of previous sites, um, and that uh, is something that you can find on USDA's website as their USDA capacity builder. Um, I can't, that will be one of the links that we send out. Um, I also have it in the chat. So um, just wanted to flag that. Um, the next two are for our panelists. So for Florida Impact, um, Someone asked, how many sponsors does Florida Impact work with, and do you ever vet the sponsors? It has been my experience that not all sponsors provide good service. I don't have the exact number of the sponsors that we work with, but we do work with a large amount. I cover the Central Florida area, and we work with Orange County Public Schools, Seminole County Public Schools, Second Harvest, Volusia County. 
Osceola County. So we work mainly with the county public schools, the large nonprofit um, food banks like Second Harvest. Those are the sponsors we normally work with. But we work also with many sites. So those sites are under those sponsorships and we connect those many sites with those sponsors. And the vetting part, um, I would have to figure out exactly what you're referring to. Is it the quality of service they provide, the way they keep their records? What is really leading you to be like, what is causing you to question, you know, the value that those sites would provide? if anything. But I do know because those organizations are reputable organizations, they've been around for a long time. And, you know, when you're working with the school board, you know that they've gone through so many different clearances already with um, state agencies, local agencies, and even federal agencies. So you know that you're walking to a situation where the licensure is probably not an issue. So I mean, we don't run into that problem because we mainly work with the school board and large food banks. Wonderful, thank you so much, much Ashina. Um, the next question that we have is, um, this might not be something you guys know off the top of your head, but do you happen to know what the minimum number of children per site your sponsors serve is? Um, how big a site uh, usually is or has to be um, to really, especially retain. I can answer that for us. Um, so for the food bank, we have um, about 20 is our cutoff uh, for sites, only because uh, that's when we, we will no longer be able to provide vended meals to a site. We want to make sure that it's attractive for our vendor partners to participate with us. So in order to ensure that they're uh, getting enough funding to maintain their operations, we ask that all of our sites have at least 20 children participating. If they drop below that number, they can still participate under our sponsorship, but they'll be moved to what we call shelf-stable meals, meals that are kept uh, on the shelves, room temperature, and that are totally fine to eat. But we find the acceptance of those meals is lower than the vended meals. The kids prefer hot meals. I, To be honest with you, I've um, ran into situations where the amount of students at a site has been very small. Like I've, um, the average has been as small as like 15 students, probably even smaller. That kind of is an indicator, either there's not enough marketing being done or um, that area may not need that resource. And that's when, that's where strategizing comes into play. But I have ran into situations where the amount of students fed is very small. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, for for our sponsorship, we and it's mainly based off of um, the requirements of our food service management company or our vendor. We generally require the site to serve twenty to twenty five kids, and they serve at least three days a week. Which is the question of where um, where everyone's located? Uh, Kelsey is um, Kelsey is with uh, North Carolina, correct? Yes, it's the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina, and we're based out of Raleigh. Yeah, so North Carolina, Alabama, and Florida are where all of our panelists are from are working in. Are there any last minute questions? I'm not seeing anything else. So again, all of this, all of the information will be shared in a follow-up email um, within a week or two uh, of this conclusion of this webinar. Um, and we wanna thank our panelists so much for, for joining us today and for uh, speaking on this really important topic. Um, and we hope to see all of 
you at our next webinar. Again, that is on February 23rd. Um, and I, if there are any outstanding questions, we will try to answer them in the follow-up email. So um, thank you so much and have a wonderful day, everyone.